Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dr. Silva. Thank you for joining me for this talk on Vralar, Cariprazine, a dopamine serotonin receptor partial agonist antagonist. It's also called a dopamine partial agonist, a dopamine stabilizer, an atypical antipsychotic, a third generation antipsychotic, although it's also sometimes included as a second generation antipsychotic agent, and mood stabilizer. It goes by all of those names. And I'll go over the mechanism of action in a moment, but it is FDA approved for the treatment of schizophrenia, both acute exacerbations, as well as the long-term maintenance of this condition. It's approved for the treatment of acute mania and mixed mania, depression and mania co-occurring, but it's not approved for the maintenance of bipolar disorder. So it's not approved to prevent major mood episodes, but it is approved for the treatment of acute mania and agitation. It's approved for the treatment of bipolar depression, that's bipolar one disorder, but for the treatment of major depression, it's approved as an adjunct. So as monotherapy all by itself, the FDA has approved it for bipolar depression, major depressive episodes in the context of bipolar one disorder, but if a person does not have bipolar disorder, if they only suffer from recurrent major depressive episodes, then this medication is approved as an adjunct. It's approved to add on to another antidepressant. And just a quick word about FDA approval. All that means is that the manufacturer conducted studies multi-phase, double-blind placebo-controlled trials over many years, and they spent millions of dollars in order to prove to the FDA that there is a statistically significant improvement when these medications are used, that they are safe, well-tolerated, and effective for these conditions. So it doesn't mean that just because we don't have the studies and they didn't present data to the FDA to be approved, for example, for the maintenance of bipolar disorder, that these medications aren't useful for that. And in fact, we commonly use cariprazine off-label, that is without FDA approval, for the treatment of bipolar disorder in the long term. And we wouldn't use it off-label if it weren't effective. So certainly there's anecdotal evidence that this medication is effective. So we don't want to get too hung up on FDA approved indications, although we do have more confidence with those because there's scientific data to prove or to not prove but to show that statistically speaking it's probably effective but we also use it off label to treat other psychotic disorders to treat the negative symptoms of schizophrenia and it's actually approved in europe for the treatment of negative symptoms of schizophrenia and we use it for behavioral disturbances and dementia, although there is a black box warning about that. It is specifically not approved for the treatment of dementia-related psychosis in the elderly because there's an increased incidence of death and cardiovascular events like heart attacks and strokes. A causal link has not been proven, but there is an association. We also use it to treat behavioral disturbances in children and adolescents, and we use it to treat disorders associated with problems with impulse control, impulse discontrol, such as gambling, as well as PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. As far as the mechanism of action, cariprazine is a partial agonist at dopamine D2 receptors, the D2 subtype of receptors. And as far as what that is, what is a partial agonist? So an antagonist is a molecule that blocks a receptor. So if it's a dopamine receptor, medication that's an antagonist would block that receptor, thereby preventing endogenous dopamine from attaching and stimulating that receptor. So it's a blocker. And when you block D2 receptors, you get a decrease in the positive symptoms of schizophrenia and you get a decrease in mania, but you also get extra pyramidal symptoms, drug-induced Parkinsonism. So you might decrease a symptom, but you might also induce a side effect by antagonizing a receptor. A receptor agonist binds to that receptor and stimulates it. 
So dopamine is an agonist at dopamine receptor types, all the subtypes. A partial agonist binds to that receptor and stimulates it, but not as much as the endogenous molecule would stimulate it. So a partial D2 receptor agonist, a partial agonist at the D2 receptor is going to stimulate that receptor, but not as much as dopamine would. And so the implication of that depends on the context. Even though it's called an agonist, if you have a situation in which dopamine concentrations are high, then a partial agonist theoretically reduces dopamine output in that situation. It's a relative decrease, thus improving the positive symptoms and mediating antipsychotic actions, similar to what you would do if you were an antagonist. However, it theoretically increases dopamine output relatively when dopamine concentrations are low, which improves cognitive, negative, and mood symptoms. So in manic states, for example, you use a partial agonist and it would have relative antagonist actions, thereby improving symptoms. In depressive states, it would have relative agonist actions thereby also improving a different set of symptoms. I hope that's clear. At low doses, cariprazine binds preferentially to dopamine 3 receptors. It has more affinity at these lower doses. And the significance of this is unknown, but it could theoretically contribute to cariprazine's effects on negative symptoms. What are negative symptoms? Negative symptoms include affective flattening. The affect is the expression of emotions. And so you see a dulling, a blunting, or a flattening of affectivity in depressive states, certainly, but also in primary psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia. You also see, in terms of negative symptoms, alogia, which is diminished speech. You see social withdrawal, asociality, which is not the same thing as antisociality. Being asocial is not the same as being antisocial. And I encourage you to check out my antisocial personality disorder video if you want more information on that. You also see avolition, which is a reduced drive to initiate and persist in self-directed purposeful activities. And you see a loss of motivation, interest, or enjoyment in day-to-day -day activities, and that's called anhedonia which is also a symptom of depression, which is very common in primary psychotic disorders like schizophrenia. So you always have to rule out depression when you see negative symptoms. But even in a patient with schizophrenia who is not depressed, you see those negative symptoms. And that's as opposed to the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, such as hallucinations, delusions, and agitation, including mania in schizoaffective disorder bipolar type you see both psychosis at baseline in the absence of major mood symptoms, but you also see manic episodes. The D3 partial agonism could theoretically be useful for treating cognition, mood symptoms, emotions, and substance abuse. Cariprazine also has a high affinity for the serotonin 1A receptor as a partial agonist, and it's an antagonist at serotonin 2B receptors. It also blocks serotonin 2A receptors, which causes enhancement of dopamine release in certain brain regions. Serotonin and dopamine oppose each other, thus reducing motor side effects. The motor side effects that you would see from blocking those receptors, drug-induced Parkinsonism, and also possibly improving cognitive and affective symptoms and interactions that a myriad of other neurotransmitter receptors may contribute to cariprazine's efficacy. But you don't see actions at muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, so there are no anticholinergic side effects, and you also don't see antihistaminergic effects, including sedation, although sedation does occur in a significant minority of these patients. Dosing goes all the way from 1.5 milligrams to 6 milligrams or more, it comes in four capsule strengths, and typically you need higher doses to treat mania and schizophrenia than you do to treat bipolar depression or depressive episodes. Because of its long half-life, a half-life is the amount of time that it takes for the body to clear 50% of a medication, and it takes five half-lives to reach steady state, and it takes five half-lives to eliminate 98% of the medication. 
Because of the exceptionally long half-life of this medication, it's two to four days is the half-life, so that's times five. And the especially long half-life of one of its active metabolites, diadesmethylcariprazine, one to three weeks, one to three weeks, you have to monitor for adverse effects and also the response, positive effects, for several weeks after you start cariprazine and with each dosage change. And by the same token, washing out the medication takes several weeks as well. The advantage of this is that missing a few doses might not be as detrimental compared to other antipsychotics. This is very similar to Prozac, which has an active metabolite norfloxacetine of one week. And so it takes several weeks to wash out these medications. And you typically you won't see withdrawal, physical withdrawal, or typically you don't see rebound symptoms. You can take this medication with or without food. You do need to monitor labs with this medication. There is a theoretical risk of metabolic syndrome, which is diabetes mellitus and dyslipidemia, either hypercholesterolemia or dyslipidemia, which is a bad ratio of the quote unquote good to bad cholesterol. So you wanna weigh all patients at baseline and track their BMI, their body mass index. And really the recommendation is to measure the patient's waist circumference at the umbilicus because an accumulation of visceral fat can be a harbinger of metabolic syndrome. It's much worse when you have weight gain that occurs in the abdomen, so increased girth than just weight gain in general. You wanna measure a fasting glucose level. I always measure a hemoglobin A1C, glycosylated hemoglobin, which is an approximate measure of a person's glucose level over the prior 90 days. That's the lifespan of a red blood cell. And a fasting lipid profile, so that if you do get signs of diabetes or dyslipidemia later, you have a basis of comparison. You also want to take a complete blood count, although Neutropenia, uh, decreased white cell count, is very rare. And also, you wouldn't expect it, but you have a theoretical risk of tardive dyskinesia, and so you want to take a baseline AIMS score, which is an abnormal involuntary movement score. Tardive dyskinesia is a movement disorder that causes sudden, uncontrollable movements in the face and body, especially periorally, involving the lips and the tongue and the upper body, the torso. Tardive means delayed or late, and dyskinesia refers to abnormal involuntary movements. This condition can develop in as little as six weeks, but really you usually see it after months or years of high dose therapy. It's blocking those D2 receptors in the striatum that can cause this syndrome. And so you really see it classically with the first and second generation agents, the high potency agents like Haldol and Risperdal. The medication is not habit forming. You don't really have to down titrate it when you're weaning it, but that's always recommended. You really shouldn't abruptly discontinue any psychotropic agent, but rebound psychosis and worsening of symptoms is less likely with cariprazine due to its long half-life. It essentially self-tapers. Side effects. One of the most common is akathisia. Akathisia is a motor restlessness, a fidgetiness, a need to move. And if you can't move and the akathisia is severe, it can feel like you're about to crawl out of your skin. It can be very strong. It's like restless legs, and it can include restless legs, and the extremities are mostly affected, but it's really restless body is what it is. And this is due to cariprazine's partial agonist actions at D2 receptors in the striatum. Here again, we have a relative, even though it's a partial agonist, it is blocking the full agonist, which is dopamine, and this causes drug-induced Parkinsonism, which is an extra pyramidal symptom. EPS. Nausea and vomiting is caused by the partial agonist actions at D2 receptors as well as 5-HT1A receptors, serotonin 1A receptors. And also these actions contribute to the activating side effects of this medication that can cause insomnia. There are other nonspecific GI side effects. Sedation is possible in a significant minority. 
and tardive dyskinesia as we've discussed, but there's less risk than with the conventional antipsychotics. Again, it's dose and time dependent. The mechanism of weight gain and the increased incidence of diabetes and dyslipidemia is unknown. However, weight gain is not expected with this medication and neither is sedation, but the latter does occur in a significant minority. You don't expect weight gain. Rare life-threatening side effects include hyperglycemia, which if it's high enough, leads to ketoacidosis that can be a part of a hyperosmolar coma, and that can cause death. It would come on suddenly, but it's rare. You also see, very rarely, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. This is a syndrome that consists of hyperpyrexia, high fever, rigidity, delirium, a clouded sensorium, and autonomic instability. That's blood pressure and pulse. You also see elevated creatinine phosphokinase levels. It's an enzyme found in muscles and myoglobinuria as you get muscle breakdown, which is called rhabdomyolysis. That myoglobin can lead to acute renal failure, which can lead to death. Again, that's super rare. You also see rare seizures. As a class, this medication is not approved for the treatment of dementia-related psychosis in elderly patients. As I stated, there is an increased risk of death in cardiovascular events, and there's a black box warning. Controversially, there is an purported increased risk of suicide in children and young adults given antidepressants and so you have to consider that. You want to use this medication with caution in patients with a history of hypotension, those patients who are at risk of falling, patients with a history of seizure, and those at risk for aspiration pneumonia because antipsychotics can cause dysphagia. This is uncommon, but it's possible. You can also see temperature dysregulation hot flashes and just overheating. And again, you have to be careful in patients who may be vulnerable to overheating, those who are dehydrated or who are on other medications with anticholinergic side effects, because that can cause overheating, and always the elderly. This is a unique medication. It may be one of the best choices for the treatment across the spectrum of bipolar disorders, from bipolar depression, to mixed states of bipolar depression and mania, to acute bipolar mania. And again, it's used off-label for the maintenance of bipolar disorder, i.e. to prevent those episodes. Cariprazine may exert its efficacy across the bipolar spectrum by its partial agonist actions at D2 receptors, mostly blocking them in limbic areas to treat mania and psychosis, while simultaneously having partial agonist actions at D3 receptors, especially in the substantia nigra ventral tegmental area, leading to enhanced dopamine release in the prefrontal cortex, and that improves mood, cognition, and negative symptoms in both schizophrenia and across the mood disorder spectrum. The ventral tegmental area is the area of the brain that's implicated in addiction and craving. All antipsychotics bind to the D3 receptor in vitro, but cariprazine has affinity for the D3 receptor even greater than dopamine itself, and it's the most potent and one of the only antipsychotics with functional D3 partial agonism in vivo, in the living brain. This means that at therapeutic dosing, cariprazine may have a unique action as a partial agonist at the D3 receptor. Clinical advantages of this profile remain to be determined, but animal models suggest that targeting D3 receptors may have unique advantages for mood, negative symptoms, and substance abuse. Thanks for listening, and Please stay tuned. Much of the information that was presented in this video was gleaned from Stephen Stahl's Essential Psychopharmacology Prescriber's Guide.